Here are five things I believe you will wish you knew before you took that statin drug off you by your doctor. Number one, that muscle damage when you take a statin drug like Lipitor, Crestor, Zocor, and others is rare, occurring in less than 1% of people. Let's take a look at that. We define muscle damage typically as a rise in muscle protein, something called creatine kinase or CK in your bloodstream, of tenfold or higher before they call it muscle damage. I'm going to ignore all the other people who have lesser degrees of muscle damage or uh, lots of muscle pain and weakness and aches without overt damage. This to me is like your insurance company saying, you know what, uh, we're only going to cover car accidents if it results in a fatal outcome. If someone dies, you just broke your leg, we're not going to cover that, that's not a real accident. Or if you have a head-on collision and you have a concussion or a skull fracture, we're not going to cover that. We won't count that as a real accident because you survived. That to me is how the statin industry defines uh, muscle damage or rhabdomyolysis is what it's called. In my experience, when I used to, many years ago, prescribe lots and lots of statin drugs, I saw that people without symptoms of muscle impairment, weakness, etc., were the exception. That the great majority of people had some sort of muscle weakness or aches or pains as a rule. Yet, no, it didn't reach the point of being outright muscle damage and kidney failure from it. But it sure did happen an awful lot, so much so that people would say things like, you know, I'm having a hard time getting in and out of my car. I really struggle just to stand up now from sitting in a chair for more than a couple of minutes. Am I getting old? I feel like I aged 10, 20 years in just a few weeks taking this drug. So in my experience, muscle impairment, maybe not to the degree the drug industry says it has to go, but lesser degrees of muscle impairment are the rule, are exceptionally common. Another thing that you might not know before you took that statin drug is that the potential for type 2 diabetes is dramatically increased. So you take this drug in the hopes of reducing cardiovascular risk, which it does a teensy weensy bit, often not at all, but it increases your potential for type 2 diabetes because it exaggerates the process of insulin resistance and increases your likelihood of developing diabetes by 30 to 50 percent. It varies sex, age, duration of taking the drug, which drug, etc. But it is not trivial. It's quite a bit. It's a very substantial increase in the uh, severity or the, the likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes. Another problem you might not have heard about is tendon ruptures. This did not get borne out in the many clinical trials of statin drugs, by the way, virtually all paid for by the statin manufacturers, but came out in numerous case reports after the fact. After these drugs were prescribed, many, many case reports of tendon ruptures, like Achilles tendons, bicep tendons, uh, uh, surfaced. Many, and these are very painful ruptures. When a tendon ruptures, it has to be surgically repaired or not repaired at all, and you're left being impaired in strength and ability and agility, etc. Occasionally, there's someone who experiences irreversible cognitive impairments. Not entirely clear, it may be genetically based, but there's an occasional person. Lots of people have mental fog and weakness on the statin drugs, but an occasional person, and this uh, thankfully is, is quite unusual, but it does happen. Someone develops irreversible impairment of their cognitive abilities, which is a very, very serious issue. It's like getting Alzheimer's within a few weeks to months, taking uh, a drug with uncertain or perhaps some benefits, and then you get lifelong cognitive impairment. Lastly, the benefits your doctor probably told you about. You take this statin drug for high cholesterol and reduce your cholesterol, you'll reduce heart attack risk by 36%, by 44%, by 55%. Is that true? Not really. What they're telling you, let's pretend you and I have a drug, okay, an experimental drug. And we have a whole bunch of people taking a placebo, and those placebo uh, people, participants, have two heart attacks out of 100 people over five years. And we give another group of people a drug. And over those same five years, only one person has a heart attack. So two in the placebo group, one in the uh, drug group. So relatively modest reduction, right? One person. 
but that's called a 50% reduction in risk. Of course, what your doctor hears and what he conveys to his patients is that this is what they think. Of every 100 heart attacks that are destined to occur, 50 will not occur, which of course is not true. But this is the statistical sleight of hand, the deceptive manipulation of statistics commonly conducted by Big Pharma and unfortunately often condoned by my colleagues. So those numbers they quote you, 36, 44, etc., percent reduction in heart attack is not true. And always bear in mind the great bulk of evidence supporting the use of statin drugs was paid for by the statin drug industry. You know that if a company says, we make the best car or filter cigarette or uh, clothes in the, in the country, and you ask, well, how do you know that? And they say, we performed a study. You ask who paid for it, and they say, we did. You know right away that's garbage, right? It's marketing. Yet that is the vast majority of evidence supporting the statin drug industry. Even if we accept their evidence at face value, the benefits are small and often non-existent. Uh, the people who've had prior cardiac events, like heart attack, sudden cardiac death, do derive a small benefit. The vast majority of other people do not. But you know what the greatest tragedy of all uh, there is with this cholesterol and statin uh, drug business? Is that it focuses all of your doctor's attention, all of the public and media's attention, all of your attention, on this thing that barely does anything high cholesterol, and statin drugs. When there are many other things you could do easily, successfully, inexpensively, that dramatically reduce cardiovascular risk, such as vitamin D, huge effects. How about elimination of the foods that trigger provocation or formation of small LDL particles, grains and sugars? How about cultivation of healthy bowel flora? That's proven to be a huge and largely untapped area that's proven to be extremely powerful. If you're interested in these kinds of strategies, these kinds of thinking, one of the best places to get acquainted is my new revised and expanded Wheat Belly, where I updated many of the concepts, many of the ideas, I extend the conversation, I condense the uh, conversations of about seven books into this one book. That's the revised and expanded uh, edition of Wheat Belly. And of course, join my conversations here on my YouTube channel in my Wheat Belly blog, a very busy place, my undoctored blog. And for anybody who wants to dive very deeply into this and engage in a real powerful program of heart disease prevention, not just based on stupid things like statin drugs and low-fat diets, I invite you to join the conversations in my undoctored inner circle. In the meantime, be skeptical of what your doctor tells you. Too many people in healthcare, not everybody, but too many are incentivized by revenue, profit, and driving the growth of their healthcare system. That's not health.